yeah, do you want to put it into um, start presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Is that working? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And thank you all very much for coming to our uh, inaugural um, CAMS Research in our Symposium for our special interest group for the BSG Annual Conference uh, 2020. Um, as uh, Laura said, my name is uh, Professor Kristen Graham Wilson. I'm presenting now on behalf of the leadership team um, for the SIG. And this is our leadership team and you will meet all of us over the course um, of today during uh, this symposium. So the whole purpose of our uh, BSG special interest group is really to bring together our BSG uh, members plus other academics, students uh, and stakeholders with a shared interest in order to strengthen uh, our research policy and practice and impact in this area. So um, we started off with um, this, this special interest group. We had our initiation meeting in July 2019 and a number um, of the leadership team met together at uh, the last BSG conference and really got together to sort of identify just, you know, uh, what the interest was, was like for um, a special interest group in care homes research. And um, Laura very much um, led this process and our, we submitted our application to the BSG in October 2019. So there's been quite a lot of work uh, going on in terms of um, establishing the group, um, setting up our communications, thanks to our, our, um, our Mark. And so we spent a little bit of time looking at the remit and thinking around the idea of what, as a SIG, we could offer um, to the sector. So this is sort of quite a, a busy slide, but it gives you an overview of the type of things that we're trying to, uh, that we thought the, the special interest group for CAMS research could achieve. So we are really around developing new research collaborations. And this is really the purpose of this inaugural symposium to really bring people together and look at, you know, what, what could we achieve in care homes research? So where there's going to be very much knowledge exchange and dissemination today. And it's going to be a two way knowledge as we go, uh, go out into breakout rooms after the presentations. But I guess our overall, we're thinking about how we can raise the quality of care through research and also involve um, both the people that are involved in care homes, in delivering care, in receiving care, and also some of the wider stakeholders. And I'll talk a little bit around how we might encourage partnership working through our research activities. So a lot of what we're uh, thinking about overall is to contribute to local, national and international policy and increase the prominence and salience of care home issues. And of course, there's, this is actually a very important point given the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of the issues experienced by care homes. And it has really shown, you know, um, shown this, you know, put the spotlight onto the level of um, the level of infrastructure within the care homes, the resilience within uh, care homes, but also the issues with lack of, fun lack of funding, staffing and things like that. So I think there's a real opportunity here for us to, you know, to join together and to think about how we can really um, address some of these issues. And one of the other things that we are um, trying to really think about within this special interest group is also to expand research capacity and provide support for early career researchers and those who are new to care home uh, research. So what do we mean by partnership working? So the first area that many of us um, on the leadership group have got involved with has been through uh, Enrich and Laura went along to one of the Enrich uh, meetings quite early on to really look at how we could link in with research ready care homes and we're going to have a presentation uh, in the symposium around that so I won't talk any more about that. Um, but also we need to think about how we can work with care home providers and not only the providers but also those uh, staff working in care homes and also care home residents to develop shared research priorities. And many of us on the le leadership team um, have actually been involved in doing this through special interest groups within our respective universities or by developing those networks um, across a region in which our universities are located. So it is really around thinking about what is actually important out in the sector and then how can we as researchers develop those, um, develop those priorities into uh, research projects. 
Uh, research advisory groups. Now, I'm sure this isn't new to many researchers who've been involved in uh, research uh, across the UK in particular, um, where we have quite an established patient and public involvement network. Um, but we really need to think about how we can involve older people into these research advisory groups, um, including those with dementia. And I've just been um, working with some people with dementia through Dementia and I um, over here in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's really, um, um, it is really uh, very humbling, I think, to work with a range of people um, who are living in the real, living in the real world with real problems and actually enabling them to come and give, um, give a real sense of what that is like, but equally to be able to shape the research through the research advisory groups. Um, and I think that's really important to think about. What would our research advisory groups look like? You know, what, who would be the relevant stakeholders uh, to have around the table to help us shape the research it actually involves um, care homes in a very real way. We also think need to be thinking about innovative methods to involve all our stakeholders. So co-production, co-design is, um, is an evolving method and one that is becoming quite popular in, um, in care homes research. And um, uh, Maria, who's also um, the co-chair of this BSG and myself are working uh, with Laura, um, and other team mem and other members um, of our team to actually think about how we can work with staff to co-produce and co-design uh, education um, opportunities for staff that work for them, as opposed to us as researchers with ideas and you know then going to care homes with those ideas. So very much um, this co-production co co-design um, approach, and that's actually um, something that we can think about from the SIG um, perspective and whether or not we are, how we can actually develop innovative methods and then let other people know about those innovative methods so that they can move uh, research forward in care homes. And finally, uh, the other aspect of partnership working, I think, is in, in data analysis and thinking about how we can involve all of our partners in analytical strategies. And it's around engaging all levels um, of ability. So it's, it's how might that happen? And this can be very challenging. And for anybody who's been involved in co-production, co-design, co it is very much around finding those strategies that enable everybody to, getting, to, getting, um, to become engaged. And one example I can give you of this, um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, I didn't have the photos to, de to demonstrate this um, because they're all on my desktop back, um, back in Queens. Um, but we worked with um, colleagues from Dementia and I, and we um, developed, they developed the codes, they developed their own, ex they gave us their own experiences, they helped us develop the codes. And then what we did is we produced those codes onto a colored card and gave them back um, to the people with dementia for them to actually arrange into themes. And that was actually quite um, a, a positive way of finding out really from people with dementia how they understood those codes and those themes in relation to their own experience. Um, and so again, I think as a SIG, we're here to think about how we can develop some innovative strategies to work with people of all levels of ability so that we can really engage um, everybody within care homes research rather than us as uh, researchers, you know, just doing it all for want of a better expression. So partnership working is a really um, exciting way of um, engaging uh, care homes within our research. And I'm hoping just to have given you a little bit of a flavour of that. And maybe we can um, take up some of these ideas later um, in, our, uh, in our breakout room. So I just want to say on behalf of the Care Homes Research BSG SIG leadership team, thank you all for coming. And I just wanted, if any of you are on social media and you're on Twitter, please feel free to tweet the symposium, to tweet your thoughts about the symposium today. Uh, you can see from this slide that we have a uh, website which is now up and running and also if you just want to get in touch with us at anything at any time if you would like to be uh, to be on our mailing list um, please email us at bsgcarehomes at gmail.com so thank you all
very much. Great, thanks very much, Christine. Um, we're going to have time, obviously, later on to discuss the SIG and what people want from it. Before we move to our next speaker, has anybody got any burning questions for Christine that they want to ask now? If so, um, either raise your hand or um, type in the chat um, and say if we will have time to discuss this later on. But I think I can't see anyone waving at me at the moment, um, virtually. Um, so we'll move to um, our second speaker, who is um, Christina Bryant, um, all the way from the University of Melbourne today. So um, I'll unmute you, Christine. Christina, is that right? Uh, there we are. Yes. I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've yes. got you now. Good. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, hello, everybody. It's, it's lovely to be talking to this, uh, this audience, and I'd like to uh, really express my appreciation to the SIG organizing committee for uh, starting such a, an innovative um, interest group, which um, I, I think uh, will have much to offer. Um, I'm uh, going to talk tonight about a, um, a pilot study that we uh, ran with colleagues here, and I'm just going to bring up, I'm just going to start sharing my screen now, um, and I just need to make sure. Right, okay. Um, so we called, uh, uh, we called this study Pleasant Activities for Wellbeing, the Paul War Study. Um, I worked with, uh, with colleagues who were based at the National Aging Research Institute in, in Melbourne. Um, and as Laura said, um, I'm based at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by background um, and uh, hence uh, my interest in uh, depression in older adults. Um, so I probably barely need to remind this audience that depression in care homes is highly prevalent. Um, this was a fairly recent Australian study uh, that found that over 50% of residents experience clinical levels of depression. Um, and of course, uh, depression reduces quality of life and is associated with serious health consequences, um, including increased risk of suicide, all-cause mortality, hospitalizations. Um, and uh, I would imagine that you also know that um, depression is undertreated in this setting um, and we really do need to get better at, um, at treating it. Uh, medication and, um, and cognitive be behaviour therapy both have a place, uh, but both also have drawbacks. Um, with medication, obviously side effects, um, and with cognitive behaviour therapy, um, the need for uh, fairly well-trained people to deliver that intervention um, and also um, generally requires a reasonably high level of cognitive ability on the part of the, um, of the resident or the older person um, and sometimes that's um, problematic uh, particularly in the, um, in the residential setting. Uh, so what might be an alternative? Uh, so the alternative that we came up with is something called behavioral activation, which is a very well established um, uh, psychological intervention um, that, um, that aims to lift mood by helping, to do, helping people to do more enjoyable activities. And it's based really on a relatively simple premise, which is that in order for us to maintain mood, we all need to do activities that are enjoyable and some that give us a sense of achievement. Um, and when people become depressed, they often activities um, and um, their mood declines, they become more withdrawn. And so you have this cycle of depression. Um, behavioral activation aims to break that cycle uh, by in, in a fairly planned and structured way, introducing enjoyable activities. It's also different from some treatments that focus more on talking or changing the way we think, what psychologists call cognitions. Um, and again, we thought that this was um, important uh, given um, the level of um, 
uh, cognitive impairment that might be found um, in, in care homes. Um, and so this importance of enjoyable activities, um, as I said, is something that's true for all of us, uh, but is even more important uh, for treating or preventing depression. And so what I'd like you to do now is just compare a day spent doing something like this, doing something like that. Um, and certainly for me, when I look at the picture on the right, uh, that has a very different effect on my mood, even just looking at the picture, uh, than looking at a pile of paperwork um, or the thought of spending the day cleaning. Not that those activities don't have a place, but, um, but I guess this is just to reinforce that link between uh, what we do and how we feel. So, um, we know that behavioral activation um, is effective um, and there've been many um, now trials that found that BA is, is a highly effective treatment. And, and lack the training to provide. And there was some evidence that, um, that we use volunteers that might benefit both the depressed resident and the volunteer. Um, so we thought that a volunteer-led program could be cost-effective using the existing um, volunteer resources of care homes. Um, and of course, that includes the enthusiasm that, uh, that volunteers uh, might have. Uh, so our aims were to investigate the feasibility and acceptability of an eight-week volunteer-led behavioural activation programme and find out whether it would improve the well-being of residents um, in residential aged care facilities. Um, so um, I don't have time to go into the sort of details of how we recruited um, the volunteers, but I suppose I do want to emphasise that they were trained uh, we gave them two half-day workshops, and the picture at the uh, at the top there is actually some of the um, sessions. Um, we talked with them about what's depression, and then sort of the key concept of the link between activities and depression. Uh, we talked about what is behavioural activation, how does it work, how can we use it and adapt it to aged care residents. And then we spend a lot of time talking about how to plan activities, practicing skills. They did lots of role plays. We did demos. Um, and in between the two sessions, they themselves actually had homework um, to do, which uh, many of them came back very enthusiastic about. Um, we helped them to generate ideas for each week of the study. We did originally think that maybe each week might have a particular theme that didn't quite work out. Um, and of course, we also talked with them about risk, uh, what to do if they were concerned about um, the, the well-being of a, of a resident. Um, so it was basically a, um, a pre-post intervention study, uh, which also included measures of feasibility. Uh, our measures of psychological symptoms were the, um, uh, the patient health questionnaire, the PHQ-9 for depression, um, and the GAD-7 for generalized anxiety disorder. Um, uh, we used the flourishing scale. Um, we also, because we were hoping that some of the activities would increase um, physical activity amongst the residents, um, the physiotherapist who was on the team suggested that we use the DeMorton Mobility Index, the DEMI. Um, and then we also kept a record of behaviors um, and, uh, and the goals that were set uh, from week to week by the, um, uh, by the volunteers through the weekly activity sheets. Um, and again, I don't really have uh, time to go too much into the sort of the detail of exactly how the sessions worked. But uh, so we recruited 12 volunteers and 18 residents. Uh, the mean age was uh, nearly 85 for the residents and quite a bit younger for the volunteers. Most were female, but we did capture a nice uh, range of ethnic diversity. Um, Melbourne is a very ethnically diverse city, and we did 
um, have uh, both volunteers and residents uh, representing a number of um, a number of groups. Um, and this was just a note to myself to remind myself to say that we uh, we were also interested to see whether the intervention would have a benefit uh, in terms of mood and flourishing in the volunteers. So we also uh, so they were they also gave informed consent and we um, and we measured uh, their their well-being as well. And to, I suppose to, to cut to the chase, uh, one of the issues was that they started out at such high levels of well-being that we had a ceiling effect and weren't able to demonstrate um, a change in their, um, an improvement in their levels of well-being. But for residents, we found a very significant um, impact of the intervention. Um, so baseline, um, here are the sort of the, the measures for depression on the PHQ. Um, at post-intervention, there was a, um, as you can see, a significant drop. Um, Hedges G was highly significant. Uh, but what we were even more thrilled about was that not only were these gains maintained, uh, but actually improved three months later. Um, so after, um, after the intervention had ceased, um, it looks as if the behaviours were actually, uh, the behaviours that had helped the resident to feel better were being maintained. Um, this was true also for anxiety. Um, and with flourishing, we saw a small but not quite significant difference. Um, uh, and um, uh, as you can see, the trend is in the right direction, but it was a non-significant difference. Um, remember, remembering, of course, that it was a small sample. Um, and I'm not giving details here of the, uh, the feasibility measures, but we did uh, we did have um, structured predefined uh, feasibility measures and those also um, panned out quite well. Um, so what did the residents uh, think about it? Um, I'm consciously thinking about what I'm doing and why. Um, I'm making sure that I do things, it's good. Um, I think most of us would enjoy it. It helps you to understand yourself through talking. And I should say that one of the things that um, residents and volunteers all valued very highly um, was, uh, if you like, the, the befriending aspect of this, um, that they made a relationship uh, with, uh, with somebody. And perhaps that's something that we, we could uh, talk about if we have time. Um, it was purposeful. Um, I looked forward to the visits. And of course, what we hoped was that um, uh, that the structure of the of the BA intervention would uh, would increase that sense of, of purpose. As for the volunteers, I'll just pop these up straight away. Um, it gives a bit more structure because I'm checking on her and making sure she's sound. If there wasn't that interaction, we might have run into problems down the track. Um, I really do think there's a place for this in every home. I would normally go in and just talk, whereas this way you've got an agenda, what you're going to try and do and do with the time. So a number of our volunteers were very experienced volunteers. Some were new, uh, but some had been volunteering um, at the facilities uh, for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, and so they welcomed having something that, as this quote um, indicates, added extra structure to what they were doing. Um, she improved in her choices. I actually can't quite see this because um, I'm just gonna move, uh, move people out of the way. Um, she improved in her choices. On the last two visits, she expressed interest in other activities. She was saying, I wouldn't know if I liked it until I get to them. So this was indicating that there was a, if you like, an openness to new experience. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we, we felt that an eight-week volunteer-led BA intervention was feasible and acceptable to depressed care home residents. Um, we felt that it has the potential to be a relatively low cost, sustainable intervention that doesn't make heavy demands on staff time. Um, I should say that we were very much supported by, uh, by key members of staff in both facilities that we went into. Um, and um, it did appear that there were mutual benefits to both the depressed residents and the volunteers. Um, and what we'd like to do is really um, you know, uh, try this out on a much larger scale to expand on our promising early results. Um, 
um, finally, I just, that's a picture of, uh, on the left, one of our volunteers uh, who was uh, super enthusiastic and an RA who worked with us for a while. Um, and um, our paper is now, is now in press. Um, and thank you very much. And I have no idea how long that took, but I'm hoping it wasn't too much more than 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. That was fascinating, really interesting, and great to see such positive um, results coming up, um, even from a, you know your, your very first um, study in uh, in the scale. Um, has anyone got any questions for Christina? Um, if so, please um, either raise your hand in the um, in your participant tab or type something in the chat box. Um, let's give people a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and if not, um, we can, if you have any questions for now, we can move on to our next speaker and then come back um, to questions later on. Um, I'll just give people a couple of seconds to respond. Um, Okay, some thanks coming through. Um, no questions at the moment, Christina. So if, if it's okay with you, I realize I think it takes people a bit of time sometimes to um, okay, we one just comes in. I was just about to move on. Um, so Sally um, has asked, would you bring any further studies on this to the UK? Um, we've got Beth asked, how did you recruit the volunteers? Um, and yeah, I'll give you those two to start with. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we recruited the volunteers through a number of means. So a number of these care homes did have their own body of volunteers, um, cohort of volunteers who were already engaged with the, uh, with the care home. Um, the research partner, the National Aging Research Institute, also has a, um, a register of volunteers. Um, and, uh, and so through those, because we were looking for relatively small numbers, um, those two means plus a little bit of snowballing uh, were enough for us to reach um, uh, to have to have twelve um, have twelve volunteers, and uh, was the other question uh, About whether bringing it we... to, to the UK? Yeah. I'd love to do that. If somebody was, if somebody would like to. Um, uh, you know, talk with with us about um, you know a joint project. I think that would be absolutely wonderful, uh, because I, I I think this is very um, you, you know, I, I don't think there's anything um, you know that couldn't translate into um, uh, you know into a different context. Fantastic. And there's a couple of related questions that have come through. Um, um, Fawn Harrod has asked whether it could be rolled out by a national organisation such as Age UK and um, somebody else I saw um, somewhere else asked a similar question as to whether this kind of work could go on without a research team present so whether other people could be trained to, to deliver it. Well one, one of the sort of the ideas behind using volunteers was that it was potentially more sustainable. I mean obviously you've got to have uh, you have to have the volunteers trained and somebody's got to do that training um, but you know one person could train quite a few volunteers um, and they oh and I should also say that they did have um, weekly calls from the RA uh, during the intervention just to check how things were going so it's not like you can't quite just sort of you know set it and set it and run um, but I think it is nevertheless a fairly low, sort of low intensity in terms of, um, certainly um, low intensity in relation to the demands made on care home staff. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that um, you know, I, I think there are a number of um, probably different models in the way in which this could be, uh, this could be rolled out. But I think it would be, um, I think that would be quite feasible. Okay, fantastic. There's a few more questions that have come through, but I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. And maybe Christina, if you could um, maybe answer some of those questions in the chat box. Um, sure, or you we'll take them very online. happy to do that. Yeah, okay, fantastic. And thank that. you again yep. for a really interesting presentation. That was, that was yes. um, great. <laughs>
Um, I realized so, that I didn't put, didn't put my email, I don't think, anywhere, but... Um, okay, do you want to type it in the chat box, maybe, then people... Oh, that's, yeah, that'll do that. Yeah, good idea. Now. Thanks, Laura. Right. Yes. Okay, right. I'm going to um, pass over to our next speaker um, now, um, who is Chris Alberton. Um, Morning. Hello. Great. Great. Yeah, I'll hand over to you, Chris. Thanks ever so much. Um, that was a wonderful talk, uh, Christina. Thanks ever so much. And um, I just noticed that our first three speakers are Christine, Christina, and Chris, uh, which is interesting. Um, I assure you that the BSG SIG is um, dedicated to uh, diversity um, as well. So we've got Stephanie into the fourth speaker. Let me share screen. Okay, and go full. Okay, so thanks everyone for, for chiming in this morning and for sort of dealing with the virtual antics, antics that we're going to uh, have to deal with in these times. I'm going to be presenting this trial to you. It's called STAND, which stands for uh, Satifex for the Treatment of Agitation in Dementia. Um, generously and kindly funded by Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, and I am the trial manager, but it's also forming the basis of my PhD. Um, having said that, I, these sorts of things do not happen in isolation and the uh, team is, is quite extensive. So I, I can assure you that I am well supervised <laughs> um, and well advised with the um, uh, chief investigator, Professor Doug Arsland, who is a old age psychiatrist uh, and experienced uh, in these areas and running trials. But also a quick mention to one of our key collaborators, Dr. Samsi uh, Kritika, who I believe is in the audience today. Um, she has been really helping me on particularly the qualitative component of this study. Um, so just a shout out there very briefly and uh, quick congratulations of being appointed onto the BSG exec committee as well. So what's the issue and why is it important? Now, just that similar to what Christine was saying, I'm not gonna go over this too in depth because I think the audience probably knows most of it, but it's targeting behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which is highly prevalent in people living with dementia, up to 98% uh, in some cases. Uh, but this particular trial is targeting clinically significant agitation, which presents in about half of people living with dementia. And what I find helpful is to think of it along these two dimensions, uh, sort of behavioral and psychological, and whether the symptoms are present or absent from the person. So these are sort of some examples of what you might find uh, as typical BPSD. Uh, as you can see, agitation and aggression, it's, it's a present symptom, it's behavioral, we also get things like depression, what Christina just talked about, which is sort of an absence of positive mood um, and a psychological. Uh, so I quite like this way of, of looking at it from uh, Van der Linde. But just for, this purpose, uh, for the purposes of this trial, we're looking at these symptoms in the top right, this cluster here of behavioral and uh, excess symptoms. So agitation and aggression, uh, it could be defined as inappropriate verbal, vocal, or motor activity, which is not an expression of unmet need. So it's not if they're in pain or if they're uh, hungry or something like that, and encompasses physical and verbal aggression. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, you can really just throw a dart with your eyes closed and it comes up with associations of negative outcomes from negative health outcomes, uh, negative sort of caregiver distress, uh, distress and burden, uh, even economic outcomes and things. So really we're looking at this as something that we want to try and mitigate, try and alleviate, um, and mostly just for increasing quality of life, which is what I love, what this conference was titled uh, in the first place. We want to try and reduce these levels of agitation and aggression and to improve quality of life. So the current approaches, what we try to do in care homes at the moment, and I'm sure you've seen already, uh, are non-pharmacological approaches in the first instance, which is highly recommended by NICE. Um, these are things like uh, behavioral activation, which is what we had just heard about. Other uh, approaches could be uh, reminiscence therapy, um, uh, massage therapy, aromatherapy, that sort of thing. But I think the, the most important aspect is that it's personalized to the individual. So 
whichever resident is experiencing these symptoms, you really want to try and talk with their family, talk with them, uh, and try and find a way to make life a bit more, um, a, a bit easier for them, a bit nicer for them. Um, now, however, in, in the more extreme cases, or perhaps in cases where uh, a resident has just moved into the home, so there's a large, uh, it's, a, it's a changing environment, and so it's a, a bit higher stress. Uh, there are drugs that are prescribed uh, in, the, in these instances. Uh, now, in the EU, which we'll still remember just for the time being, but we will continue to have this uh, going on, risperidone, which is antipsychotic, is uh, prescribed for agitation. Um, but there's also things like off-label antidepressants, off-label analgesics that are prescribed by doctors and GPs to try and treat the symptoms of agitation. Now, as you can imagine, these, uh, well, these have modest effects, unfortunately, not, not the greatest of impact, uh, and come with considerable uh, negative side effects. So the increased uh, uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, higher mortality rates, uh, and so forth. And this has really been borne out in, in the literature um, and in the mortality statistics, unfortunately. So what we're trying to do is we want to try and find a safer, just as effective, if not more effective, alternative to uh, the current drug treatments where non-pharmacological treatments haven't been effective. Which leads us to this trial. And for those who are not aware, Satavex is a cannabis-based medicine. Um, and the reason we've chosen cannabis-based medicine is that um, many people may, may not be aware, apologies if you are, but we have a pre-existing endocannabinoid system within us. It's a, it's a system that's already native to our bodies, and it's a system we're trying to tap into with the exogenous cannabinoids. This system is a, it's a communication system that goes uh, throughout the nervous system, and it's implicated in the main homeostatic uh, systems such as appetite, pain, mood regulation, uh, muscle control, and, and sleep regulation. So really it has the power, if we can try and tap into it uh, correctly, to um, have an impact on all these um, aspects. So phytocannabinoids, which is basically the plant, um, the cannabis plant, if that can be um, appropriately targeted to our internal cannabinoid system, uh, it could be a multi-target therapeutic. So it would, it would be hypothesis is that it can perhaps improve sleep, improve mood, improve pain, all of the above. This, is, this might be where you sort of hear these rumors of uh, cannabinoids being a panacea, and it really it stems from the fact that our internal system is implicated in so many of these aspects. Um, but the, the plant itself, we're still trying to figure out what parts of the plant has the right effect. Now in the lab, cannabinoids have been found actually to be neuroprotective agents. So they increase the resilience to harmful stimuli, um, such as neuroinflammation, oxidative stress. This is a very positive um, finding. But as always, translating that to in human clinical studies is a bit, is a bit more of a jump. So what we've got so far, the evidence suggests that it's promising but it's small. The studies that we have at the moment, uh, if you look at the column with N, uh, they're still quite small sample sizes. So these are all pilot studies and case studies um, that have looked at various cannabinoid drugs. So DRO stands for dronabinol, and NAB stands for nabilone. Uh, these are both THC synthetic uh, drugs that have been tried in a variety of countries either on nocturnal behavior to so sleep disturbance or AA, which is uh, agitation and aggression. And they all found positive effects, but they're still quite small. And unfortunately, the, the study design, it's not necessarily the gold standard study design. We're only just dipping into those now, where uh, Herman last year just published a, a placebo clinical trial, a uh, placebo controlled clinical trial of 38. And, and found positive effects. So to move on to our sort of drug of interest, Satavex, it's produced by GW Pharmaceuticals here in the UK. It is already a licensed medication um, and it's used to treat MS, multiple sclerosis. 
with a sort of stiffness in the joint. Um, and we're looking to hopefully repurpose it and see what uh, psychiatric um, potential it might have. It's, as you can tell from the picture here, it's a oral spray and it contains 50% THC, which is the psychoactive component, and 50% CBD, which um, put together has been, that there has been evidence to, to suggest it has a synergistic um, potentiating effect to each other. So they sort of boost the positiveness of each other. It's not without its side effects, unfortunately, like with any drug, um, but I would argue that these side effects here are much uh, more, much more agreeable uh, than the current antipsychotics. So you have things like dry mouth, slight dizziness uh, directly after administration and fatigue. Uh, in some, certain instances, uh, like if you're having sleep disturbance, fatigue might even be a bonus if you're trying to uh, improve sleep behaviors. Um, now, I'm going to talk about recruitment very quickly. Uh, just a quick, caveat, uh, quick um, disclaimer. We were hoping to have started this study already uh, about a few months ago, actually. Um, but with current circumstances, I think it's understandable that we had to delay the start. So uh, apologies that I don't actually have any data to uh, present at this time. But uh, hopefully we'll, you know, we're working with the HRA and, and uh, sort of access to care homes and things like that uh, moving forward and hopefully we'll be starting soon. When we do start, we're looking to recruit in our regional care home research network that we've set up. It's 200 plus research ready care homes um, with a demonstrated history of, um, of, of studies uh, and clinical trials that we've operated in before. Um, we've done trials of non-pharmacological interventions, for instance, like um, ECM mapping and uh, e-learning interventions. And I'm excited to go out into these homes and, uh, and see what they think and try and get the study started. I'm also excited to hear about the other regional networks throughout the country, by the way, where we potentially liaise and work together. Um, because it does seem that it's, it's a bit regional, but I, I love that the, the SIG is, is bringing everyone together and bringing these networks together. Um, good brings me to you. I'm always open to discussing collaborations uh, and having numbers and so forth. So the study, um, the full title, we're moving on. A slight delay. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a mixed method feasibility study, and this is very important. So it, uh, it is still a pilot study. We're really looking at whether or not it's feasible and acceptable uh, treatment in care homes and nursing homes, whether it would be accepted by the population, uh, and whether it sort of engenders um, promising results to lead to a larger trial. This is the first study of its kind in the UK, so that's why we couldn't necessarily jump straight into the large trial, of, um, a, a larger confirmatory trial. So it's a pilot study, we're using mixed methods, you know, it's going to be a qualitative component which the seeker is kindly um, advising us on. And that's not to say that we won't be exploring the impact on neuropsychiatric symptoms or BPSD as well. Just give a quick overview. I hope I'm not overrunning. I haven't been keeping track. We're looking to recruit 60 people living with dementia in nursing homes aged 55 to 90 and presenting with clinically significant agitation, I should say. Um, and then as it's a clinical trial, it is important that we separate into a placebo group and uh, receiving Sativex um, so that we can have a comparison of, uh, of how Sativex might be um, impacting the population. The trial will involve taking the drug for about four weeks, or four, four weeks exactly, uh, starting at a low dose so that we can assess its safety and then working up to a dose which we think might have some uh, therapeutic impact. So we're going to follow this titration schedule here. Um, so in week one, we'll have two sprays, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. And then 
moving up to week three and four, where there'll be four sprays a day uh, spread throughout the day. Now, we're, we're try those are very rough times. We're trying to time the sprays around the tea and lunch times um, to mitigate the side effects I mentioned earlier. So uh, experiencing dry mouth or um, a slight feeling of dizziness. If we can time it to times when there is refreshment and uh, a fresh refreshment available and they're in sedentary positions, that's where we're hoping it, it's a bit safer and lowers the risk of falls. We've also uh, leaned it a bit more to the evening, so that if there's a higher dose in the evening, we're hoping that that will improve sleep behaviors as well. So next methods design, looking at the feasibility, safety, acceptability, and estimating the efficacy of Saturday. So we're going to see if there's a difference, um, but it is not statistical power for that. We'll do this by, uh, we have study doctors on the team who will be assessing physiological measures, doing a physical exam. Uh, there will be bloods taken as well, just to make sure the underlying biochemistry is it's safe and um, uh, for liver function and kidney function. Um, and that will be a before and after test. And then we have an assortment of um, quite well-known psychiatric measures, uh, quite well-known in the care home research uh, uh, area as well. Primary outcome is CMAI, which is the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Inventory. The MPI, which is the neuropsychi Neuropsychiatric Inventory, which will go across a variety of symptoms, that's including depression, psychoses, uh, behavioral symptoms, as well as things like appetite and sleep. Uh, quality of life, which I personally love the most, um, because I think that's the outcome that most patients in the public uh, want to see improvement on, uh, and that's sort of been reliably found as well. We're looking at function and frailty. So FAST is a measure of uh, daily function, and the CFS is the clinical frailty scale. Um, so just looking at aspects of that. And then uh, secondary outcomes of pain and cognition. So pain, where we'd like to see if there's an impact on, on pain management and, and dealing with pain. And then cognition, we're not expecting any sort of improvement on cognition and dementia. So it's not directly looking at cognitive symptoms in dementia, it's more behavioral symptoms. But we want to just ensure that there's no negative consequences for using cannabis-based medicine or cognition. Now this is a, uh, I'm quite looking forward to this. this is, um, so tying in with recent trends, we'll be using wearable watches as well, uh, called actigraphy data. And this is really so that we can look at the times when there isn't a care around, when there isn't uh, anyone around to sort of see how the resident is doing, uh, particularly around sleeping behavior, so we can really get a measure of how they're sleeping, if there's a change in their sleeping behavior. Uh, but also agitation is, is commonly presented with wandering or pacing, if there's a reduction in pacing or wondering, this will be borne out in the wearables data. Uh, and then finally, perhaps most importantly, part of the, as a feasibility pilot study, the qualitative component, we'll be conducting interviews uh, with the resident themselves if they're able and if they consent to it, uh, with their direct key worker and hopefully with relatives as well if they are available. Uh, and just to look at um, aspects of implementing this treatment in care homes. So how was it using an oral spray? I don't think it's a very common method of administration. It's mostly solutions or tablets. Um, and then also there's, the, the word cannabis is, is a bit of a it's, a, it's a hot word, a hot potato word. It can be a bit, a bit striking. And I just wanted to know, we just wanted to know the sort of societal attitudes towards cannabis-based medications, whether or not um, uh, it, it can sort of be spun in different ways, unfortunately, through the media and, and how it's viewed. And so we're, we're hoping to put some robust evidence uh, for or against uh, in this case, and just to see if it's acceptable. Uh, a small caveat to that, I should mention that at our CRTRN conference about three years ago, we were approached by a few care home uh, practitioners who had mentioned that they were using cannabis-based products in their care home already without sort of uh, any uh, sort of evidence to back it up. So it was, 
It was quite interesting actually that it was, it was almost public and patient led this idea and that's how we came up with this idea. So in summary, uh, why are we doing it? It's a very common symptom and agitation is, um, has negative outcomes across the board as I mentioned, health, economic and uh, the caregiving. The current drugs are very well, much too risky in my opinion for the modest effect that it has. Uh, so we're looking for a safer alternative. <clears throat> and if we can tap into that internal cannabinoid system effectively with the appropriate com composition of cannabinoids, um, it has the potential to be a multi-target therapeutic. So to help with uh, sleep and agitation and a, the majority of those uh, behavioral positive symptoms. It'll be a mixed method study. And we have a PPI group that's on our trial steering committee uh, it was informed by PPI as we developed it. Um, we're gonna, it's going to inform a larger trial to assess efficacy, so it's still just a feasibility pilot. We're going to look at societal attitudes and uh, the novel route of administration. And when it starts, and I'm so sorry again that we don't have any data just yet, um, and hoping soon, obviously, in, in this world we're in right now, it's going to be... I honestly can't say when, but hopefully soon. Um, and with COVID, we're expecting a surge in, in PTSD and neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, so really, we want to make sure that there's better treatments out there in this. So thanks ever so much. This is again, just quickly, just a thank you. Um, funded by ARUK. I should mention that whilst GW Pharmaceuticals are providing the drug, there is no commercial ties to the study. So we're very lucky it's academic led and charity funded. So there's, there's no sort of conflict of interest or anything there. Um, thank you ever so much. I will stop sharing my screen now and I'm glad to take questions. Thanks, Chris. That was again, another fantastic presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, we've had one question come through already from Mark, who is also thanks for the excellent presentation and has said he's interested to know more about your process for gaining consent from participants with dementia. So are you using a particular approach? Um, you said you interview participants if they can consent to this, but what if they um, cannot consent to take part? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, there's a very well um, structured process to do this, um, recommended by NICE and the HRA. Uh, in the first instance, we want to assess mental capacity and always assume mental capacity first. So we'll um, want to make sure that if the resident does have, them, uh, does have capacity, that we go straight to them, inform them about the study and take consent directly from them. Now, uh, in clinical trials of drugs, there's a specific process to con uh, obtain consent without, uh, if they don't have capacity, if they're lacking capacity. And that's through a legal representative, a personal legal representative, so usually a close family member or friend, and we can go direct to them and ask them for advice on whether or not the, uh, they think their friend or relative would want it to have participated. And if they don't have a personal legal representative, we will be going, uh, we will use a professional legal representative, and that's usually a member of their healthcare team that knows them well enough and uh, it feels like they know them well enough that they could comment on what they think they would want them to do. Uh, interestingly enough, we, uh, we had a slight alteration in, in our method of consent um, because of COVID, in fact, and we were trying to get ethical approval for digital consent, particularly from legal representatives. So if a personal legal representative is not uh, available or because we can't do, to, to maintain social distancing, uh, we want to potentially see if we can get ethical approval to get um, to use consent forms that can be e-signed. I don't think that's been done before in care home clinical trials. So that's still in, in the works and under the deliberation. We'll be excited and to see if that comes about. I think it might uh, have larger implications just even beyond this pandemic. Okay, great. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. So a, a couple of people have commented on the method of administration, um, the spray being quite unusual and perhaps different to what residents might be used to. Um, so whether you've had any feedback um, on that method of administration, how acceptable it is, what people make of it. No, absolutely. That's, 
honestly, again, one of the most exciting things about this study is rather than it just being cannabinoid-based medicine, uh, the method of administration, the, the only feedback we've had so far from our PPI focus groups. <clears throat> so in the build-up to the study, when we were talking about uh, this route of administration, uh, the, it, it was, there was a positive response, but we, there was no uh, robust evidence to suggest either way at the moment. But we, what we were hoping to find out is whether or not it increases compliance. So in an agitated, especially to this extremity, um, there can be a lot of refusal to take medication or a refusal to swallow or struggle swallowing even if they're an advanced level of dementia. So this method in particular, it's just sprayed into the mouth and absorbed through the lining uh, or absorbed through the tongue. So it doesn't even require swallowing. So it's, it's gonna be interesting, but that's where we really wanna to talk to nursing home staff in, in how it's used and how they felt using it, whether it was more or less difficult. So we're really excited to see the results from that. Great, okay, fantastic. And uh, we've had a couple more questions coming in. I think in the interest of time, I'll leave you to answer those in the chat um, sure. and we'll move on to the next presentation. But thanks again for a really fantastic presentation. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. Thank you. Um, so we are going to move on to our final presentation now, um, which is um, presented by Stephanie Green. Um, I'm just going to unmute her and hopefully she will appear. And <laughs> Stephanie has been um, fantastically organised and has actually pre-recorded her presentation. So we're going to give that a go, I think, aren't we? See how that we are. <laughs> I mean, it's more due to the um, very temperamental Wi-Fi connection as well. But um, so fingers crossed that it works. And if not, hopefully Laura can step in with the backup. Um, yeah, so really, really pleased that so many people have joined today. Um, and like Chris said, my work doesn't happen in isolation either. Although I'm the um, only member of um, official staff for the Enriched Cymru Network in Wales, um, I've worked really closely with uh, Dr. Vicky Shepherd, who I think is still on the call today, um, developing resources um, and including residents who lack the mental capacity to consent. So that's really interesting um, that that issue was just raised then. And I think that's something that we need to consider further, especially if we're considering um, e-consent. Um, so that's really interesting. Also, I've been working really closely with um, Sandra Prue, and I think Sandra's on the call, um, who coordinates the West Midlands Enrich Network um, and does a lot to coordinate um, the networks across England as well. And I think Fawn is on Enrich and Sally and a few others and also some colleagues. I've got some colleagues here from Swansea University who've um, supported Enrich. So although it's um, just me for Wales, um, I'm, I'm part of a wider team. Um, so. Uh, as well as coordinating the network on six hours a week, I'm a full-time PhD student um, and uh, there's not much scope here to explain the whole project, but I'm focusing on the development of intergenerational care in care homes specifically. So if anyone's interested in that area, please do get in touch. Um, I'll type my email address in the chat box and it's also at the end of the presentation. Um, so let's see if this magical wizardry will work with my presentation. So I'm going to start now. Um, Laura, if there's any issues, if you just message me on the chat and let me know, but I'm going to start now. So fingers crossed, bear with me. Okay, so welcome to this presentation about um, the Enriched Cymru Network and how we can best support care homes through research during this pandemic. Just as a brief overview, um, firstly, I'd like to cover um, the development of um, the Enrich Network in Wales, just to give you some background really on how it's developed. And then some of the current opportunities and challenges we face at the moment in terms of um, care home research in this pandemic, which should lead nicely on to um, a suggested topic for discussion afterwards around uh, more broadly, what are the what are the infrastructural mechanisms that we need um, in this time to be supporting care homes through research um, during this pandemic. Um, so that will link into that broader discussion about the role of the special interest group um, and how we can work together um, in, in everyone's professional backgrounds. So first of all, uh, what is Enriched Cymru? For those of you less familiar with the Enriched Networks, they exist across um, the UK, um, so across Wales, England and Scotland, not yet Northern Ireland. Um, so 
the Enrich Network was developed in the, in the response to um, some of the challenges that um, are present in conducting research in care homes and, um, and the fact that care homes often miss out on a lot of these opportunities, um, a point which we'll return to um, a bit later in the presentation. Um, so the networks in England were set up about eight years ago um, and here in Wales in the Enrich Network was developed through the Wales School for Social Care Research and the Centre for Ageing and Dementia Research. And both of those centres um, are funded by the Welsh Government through Health and Care Research Wales. Um, and being based in Swansea University, we've been in this really unique position to develop um, the network as fit for purpose in Wales. And it's had a really specific focus on the care home community of being front and central um, in its development. Um, and really looking at um, developing a collaborative two-way partnership approach, which I'll explain a bit more now. So being a research network, um, we've drawn on um, a systematic review, so a piece of evidence that suggests the best way to um, develop research in care homes on a, on a longer term basis, really, is building up those long term relationships with care home providers. And this is best done through a research network. So drawing on that approach um, to keep keep care homes um, linked up and um, up to date with um, what's going on. And also, more, most importantly, asking what are, what are your most important questions to be developing? So just to recap, and I'm sure most of you are already aware of the importance and why we even bother co-producing research and why it's especially important in care home research. So firstly, it's, um, as I've alluded to, ensuring that the most relevant questions and issues um, to the care, care home community are explored um, rather than them always being top down priorities. Um, we've done this in a number of ways. Um, I've not got enough time to go into detail here about um, all the different ways we've been doing this with the network. But um, this picture I present on the slide, um, it's actually me about two years ago in the beginning. Um, and this was a co-production workshop looking at the um, developing end of life care in care homes. So you can see we're side by side. Um, so that's really the, the approach that the Enrich Network takes in Wales. Um, and secondly, and really has becoming more and more important during this time, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, is that um, we ensure that participants are actually included um, in the sense that if they're lacking in mental capacity to consent to be in part, that um, care homes are educated and we work through resources, we develop, sorry, we develop resources with um, Dr. Vicky Shepherd in Cardiff University for, for care homes to um, follow through that process um, of, of involving um, residents in, in research. And also that um, we're working with research teams to make sure that um, participants able to understand the study resources. And these things sound quite straightforward and obvious, but um, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And, and thirdly, that um, by co-producing research, we're ensuring that the most appropriate methods and measures are selected and researchers aren't just dreaming up these wild projects that could never be, that wouldn't be feasible to carry out in this setting. So, reasons really. Okay, so, um, Moving on then to um, the current situation that we find ourselves in, and I won't, I'm not going to recap on how events have unfolded and the numbers, but I will just say that here in Wales we have um, the most up to date figures that have come from the Older People's Commissioner's report suggest we have about 15,000 residents in Wales in, in nursing and residential homes, and we have roughly about 65,000 um, care home workers. So a population already of about 80,000 people in that care home community as well as all the family and friends and loved ones who are connected to these communities so just just an idea of sort of the numbers we're talking about um, so firstly just to flag up um some of the the gaps that have um come to light um over these last few months um it's quite easy to make, draw a comparison between um the the progress made uh, in research in um acute healthcare hospital settings and social care settings, especially in care homes. So almost instantaneously, we saw research um, up and running in hospitals. And yet it wasn't until two or three months down the line that we saw the first um, trial being open for care homes. Um, and that's the principal trial. That's a 
platform randomized, I forget the rest of the acronym, um, trial. And that basically, this trial is basically um, looking at um, different medications um, to kind of yeah, control the control symptoms of COVID-19 run by Oxford University. And I just want to return to my earlier point about um, ensuring that um, participants are included in the study. Well, unfortunately, in this trial so far, um, they took the decision that um, care home residents who do not have capacity, the mental capacity to consent would be automatically excluded from the study, um, which is a real shame. Um, and we've got some important questions to ask really now around who is setting the research agenda and who is who is the research most helpful for um, and how can care homes contribute to the research agenda. So just just to name a couple of the opportunities. Uh, encouragingly, here in Wales, we have an older people's commissioner um, and over a period of about two weeks, um, their office went out um, and did face to face engagement sessions um, and did surveys online, on the telephone, by email. Um, and they had over 120 responses and it's really elucid uh, illuminating the care home voice in this in this scenario. And I really like how our commissioner um, describes and our commissioner describes care and community as experts by experience. So obviously in our, all our professional backgrounds, we bring our own levels of experience and everything to the table, but actually we need to listen to the care homes first. Um, and I just think this is one of the most important messages coming from that report, suggesting that, you know, people in this care and care community must be provided with opportunities to share their views and experiences. And just to make sure that the things that matter most to residents are properly understood um, and shape care in positive and national. And this is one of the ways in which um, research can, can sort of speed this process along. So the network has really had um, an evolving role to play during the pandemic so far. Um, and with the additional funding from Welsh Government um, to Centre for Aging and Dementia Research and the Support and Delivery Centre at Health and Care Research Wales, this role will continue to evolve, which is really exciting. Um, so to date, um, the network's had quite a big advocacy role, actually, um, in um, advising and informing new research, which has either been in development or is open to recruitment. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the principal study, so um, suggesting um, to different study teams that residents who lack the capacity to consent in research can still be involved by using a personal consultee. Um, so kind of playing that advocacy role in sort of new studies, really. Um, sense checking, so things like resources, um, if any resources are sent to the network, um, it's our role to sense check with um, care home managers. Are these useful? Can you add to them? So the NIHR in England have an academic research collaboration, the ARC, and they've developed some top tips drawing on um, the evidence base. And those will be sent out through the Enriched Crummy Network um, to check with managers, are these useful? Would you add to them? Uh, supporting new research, um, so for example, uh, PPE study, which has been developed at Cardiff University, has had um, the voice of a care home manager into the, put into the application. Um, and then pre-COVID roles, really, so communicating the value of the role of research through writing papers and, and webinars and, um, and various blogs and things like that, um, as well as cascade, cascading information um, about any new and developing studies as far as is possible, really, um, with my capacity. OK, so um, just a couple of references here to finish. And the second one is the OPC report I referred to earlier in the presentation. Um, contact details below. Please do follow the network on Twitter for updates or drop me an email on my email address just below. Um, the website, the Enriched Cymru website, is a little bit outdated. Um, we're hoping to update soon, um, but please do have a look. Um, or if you're in England, the, the website below is for the, for the English networks as well. So um, thanks very much and look forward to the discussions. So I've stopped sharing. I hope that worked OK. I'm sorry if there were random noises <laughs> throughout, but hopefully that worked OK. Yeah, it's certainly from my perspective, it was very clear and a, a really interesting, um, a really positive presentation as well. Um, 
seeing if we had any questions about a couple of comments come through so far um posting how valuable the work is for older people um and mark has um commented about um you know how sadly it is that people who lack capacity mm -hmm. or perceived to lack capacity to consent are often excluded from studies which is you know considered an ethical um issue in itself uh, i don't even wanted to comment on that at all well, just to highlight, really, that was a really big issue pre-COVID anyway, pre-existing. And like I said, Dr. Vicky Shepherd's done a lot of work in this area. Um, and it just seems to, I think, in lots of areas of our lives, um, this pandemic has really shone a bright light on this issue. Um, and it's important that um, in all of our roles, we kind of speak up and we fly the flag for care homes and for those people living in care homes who um, are often excluded from these opportunities. So. Um, just a call to action really from me. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, so one question's come in from Fawn Harrod um, asking, so very interested in the co-production in care homes um, and whether there's any particular guidance or resources around this you could recommend. I haven't got anything on the Enrich Cymru website at the moment, um, but I know, um, I think it, they call the co-production network in Wales. Um, I think I've got the name right, but um, Fawn, I can send you the link for that, um, that, that um, organisation and they do a lot of work developing resources. So um, they, would, they would be the go-to, I think, in Wales, but anyone else feel free to chip in if I've, if I've forgotten anyone. Right. Okay, um, fantastic. I think there'll be more chance to um, discuss these issues, as you said, in, in the next session anyway, when we're going to focus particularly on how to support research um, in care homes given the COVID pandemic. Um, if anyone's got any, any other questions um, for Steph or any of the speakers, please feel free to keep putting them in the chat box because we'll be coming back to the main room. What we're going to do now is um, switch to breakout rooms. I'm going to stop the recording um, right now. <laughs>